Hello, this is Ms. DB, and in this video we are going to go over how to do some of the problems from your worksheet on Chapter 2, Section 1, which is using inductive reasoning to make conjectures. So first of all, you should read pages 74 through 77 in your online textbook to get a good overview of what this lesson is all about. And you can also watch the lesson video there and then complete this worksheet. All right, so here's an example. It says to identify a pattern, and you just have to figure out what's going to happen next. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Looks like they're going every other day. They didn't include Tuesday or Thursday. So if we do every other day, the next day would be Sunday. So you just are looking at what is given to you and seeing if you can figure out how they got that and what they're going to do next. So let's look at our examples here. We have number one, one-fourth then one-half, then three-fourths, and one. So if you think about maybe like a pizza, first somebody has one-fourth of the pizza, now they have one-half of the pizza, they added more to it. Then they have three-fourths of the pizza. It looks like they're adding a fourth every time. So three-fourths plus one-fourth, yeah, that would be one. And then we just have to find the next item after that. So after one, if we added one more fourth, we would get one and one-fourth. So you can leave your answer like that, or you could write five-fourths. That would be fine too. Okay, then um, this problem, you have to figure out how did they get 100, how did they get 81, how did they get 64, how did they get 49, and then see if you can figure out the, the pattern from there. And I'll give you a hint, we talked about this when we talked about squares and square roots in your previous courses. So that's a big hint on what is happening in this one. Um, number three, you might kind of guess that these might be some states. Well, they are states, and then you have to figure out how are they figuring out what state to put and what would be the next one. You might have to look that up. And number five, there's more than one answer. They start with one dot and no segments, and they have two dots, and then there's a segment that connects it and then they have three dots and it's connected with these three segments and then you might decide how you think the fourth element in the sequence would look there's more than one way to do that and if you decide that you want to add like a square or something um, let me see if I can show this to you go to the insert button in Word if you're typing your work and then go to shapes and then there's a line segment so if you decided you wanted to have um, four, I'm going to darken that a little bit, we'll turn it black. If you wanted to do like a square, I'm not saying that's the answer, but if you did, then you can draw it using the insert shapes menu. It's not super speedy, but it's not that bad. It's probably... A little bit quicker than going and drawing it on paper and then taking a picture of it and then <laughs> shapes there or you know what I should have done that one's kind of crooked I could have just inserted a square that's what I should have done I could have just drawn one um, this one is filled in and it shouldn't be Let's see, it should be not filled in. There we go. So now we have a rectangle, or you could make it be a square if you wanted by dragging it. Okay, so you get the idea. Let me go back to the way I wanted this to be set up. All right, inductive reasoning. Here's a new vocabulary word. Inductive reasoning is the process of reasoning that a rule or statement is true because specific cases are true. We just used inductive reasoning. When you're trying to figure out what happens next from a pattern, that's inductive reasoning. When you make a statement based on inductive reasoning, that's called a conjecture. So we made a conjecture that the next number in this sequence would be 5 fourths. We made a conjecture that the next shape in this sequence would be a square or a rectangle. And we used inductive reasoning to get to that point. So in this one, it's pretty much the same thing. We're going to try to figure out a pattern, and then we're going to make finish our conjecture. What, what do we think is going to be the next thing to happen? 
So you might have to do some problems. You have, might have to work this out. Like this says the product of an even number and odd number. So I did several examples. And then I looked at what I got for answers and then made a conjecture about what the answer would be. So you can look over those examples some more. I don't want this video to be too long, so I'm going to move on, on to some problems. Let's look at number um, eight. It says, if the side length of a square is doubled, what will happen to the perimeter of the square? The perimeter of the square is blank. We have to find what to fill this in with. Don't just put it'll be bigger or increase. We want to be more specific than that. So we could draw some squares out, or we're just going to fill in this table. So let's say we have a square that has side length 1. The perimeter would be 4 times 1, so that would be 4. If we double the side length, that is if we go from this 1 and we double that, we would have 1 times 2. So now we'd have 2 for our side length. And then the perimeter would be 4 times 2 equals 8. So the part that I'm going to want to compare is this, this column and this column. I want to know if I double the square length, how does the perimeter change? So it went from 4 to 8. Okay, let's, let's try another example. When the square has a side length of 2, then the perimeter would be 2 times 4, which is 8. And then I would double that. I would go from a side length of 2 to a side length of 4. Then my perimeter would be 4 times 4, which is 16. So I went from 8 to 16. So I went from 4 to 8, and then 8 to 16. Okay, let's do another one. Side length is 3, so the perimeter would be 3 times 4, which is 12. So I have 12 for my first perimeter. Then if you double 3, you get 6. And then the perimeter of that would be 6 times 4, which is 24. So I went from 12 to 24. So you might have enough now to make your conjecture. I went from 4 to 8. I, I doubled it. I went from 8 to 16. That's also doubled, or times 2. And then I went from 12 to 24. I, I times it all by 2. Or So we could say it's doubled or times by 2, or multiplied by 2 would probably be a better way to write that. All right, so that's how you make a conjecture based on a pattern. All right, this is just an example with a application kind of problem. Do I have the beginning there? Yeah. So this is, oh, this is number nine. It got moved down because I typed too much. But this is actually problem number nine, and you have to answer this question. So here's your graph. And then you have to say whether conjecture A or B is true based on this graph. So conjecture A says to find the next point on the grid, I will add one to the x coordinate and subtract one from the y coordinate. So think about if where that point would end up if you started with 4, 4, added one to x and subtracted one to y, if it would fit in with this pattern. Or is it conjecture B to find the next point on the grid, add one to both the x coordinate and the y coordinate. So if I added one to 4 and 4, I'd get 5, 5. Does that fit with the pattern? So your answer goes here. And you're going to say something like, I think conjecture, and then you pick A or B, is correct. Okay, then we get the application problem, which is based on a pattern. What do you think is going to happen next? And then you get to answer an application problem based on the lengths of five green iguanas after birth and then after one year. So here's five iguanas, and this is how much they, how long they were when they were born, and then this is how long they were after one year. Now there's more than one answer for for these questions because we're making conjectures, which are, you know, kind of like guesses, but really good educated guesses. Number ten says estimate the length of a green iguana after one year if it was eight inches long when it hatched. So you have to think about None of these iguanas were 8 inches long, but give a good estimated guess at what you think it would be after one year. In 11, it says make a conjecture about the average growth of a green iguana during the first year. So you can look at these numbers here, 
10, 9, 11, 12, 10, and then look at this second, this third column here, and how much about did each of these iguanas grow? So make a conjecture, like you might say they doubled or tripled, or they, you might say they each grew about two feet, or they each grew about three feet, or you might say that, I don't know, something like that. Write, write a sentence about how much a green iguana might grow during the first year. And then number 12 is not about the iguanas. It's a question about some bacteria. So you have to answer this question about how fast the bacteria increases if it started at 150, after 20 minutes it was 300, and after 60 minutes it was at 1200. So see if you can figure out the pattern there and say how fast the bacteria is increasing. Okay, and then the last part of this worksheet is proving a conjecture true or false. To show that a conjecture is always true, you must prove it to be true all of the time. This is difficult to do. This is why we do proofs in geometry, and we'll do that soon. However, to show that it's false, you only have to find one example in which it's false. This is called a counterexample. So that might be a drawing, a statement, or a number that shows the conjecture is not true. So it's much easier to prove that a conjecture is false than to prove that it's true. All right, it, um, here's just an example. It says for any integer n, n is always going to be less than or equal to 4n. So they tried some different numbers. It was true at 3 because 3 is less than or equal to 12. It was true for 0 because 0 is less than or equal to 0 because it's equal. But at negative 2, negative 2 is not less than or equal to negative 8. Negative 8 is less than because it's farther to the left in the number line. So it's false for the negative number. So this conjecture is not a good conjecture. It's false because of that counterexample. So what you need to do on 13, 14, and 15 is find a counterexample. Each of these is false. There's a mistake in all of them, and you need to find that mistake or find a mistake and say how it could be true. So for number 13, it says for any integer, n cubed is greater than 0. So your, your counterexample is just going to be one example when that is not true. So... At, let's say n equals 1. Well, that's true. 1 cubed is 1, which is greater than 0. So 1 doesn't work as a counterexample. Try 0, try negative numbers, try fractions. Find an example where when you cube it, it's not greater than 0 anymore. For 14, supplementary angles are adjacent. They can be adjacent, but they don't have to be. You could just have two angles that were... Um, like 90 degrees, but not touching each other, so then they're not adjacent. So you could draw two examples, or you could explain why that's what what would be an example so that it's not true. Counterexample. And then number 14, three points on a plane always form a triangle. You might say what else the three points could do. Like they could all be in a line, they could be collinear, and then they would not form a triangle. For 16 and 17, all you need to do is find a counterexample from the graph. Number 16 says every one of the first eight matches lasted less than an hour. You just need to go up here and find one that lasted more than an hour, and that's your counterexample. So it's much easier to prove a conjecture false than it is to prove a conjecture true, and you're not asked to prove them true yet. These will be false. All right, thank you very much, and have a wonderful day.